<laughs> well, let me let me just uh, be curtail the excitement for a moment. Okay. Uh, we are live. We are <laughs> live now. To... Welcome everybody <laughs> to the um, uh, February seventeenth meeting of the Community Safety Working Group. Uh, I'm going to call this meeting to order at five thirty-three p.m. Here on the seventeenth. Mr. Wiley, I think someone is not muted, so it's causing a lot of disturbance okay. in the background. So we're getting some feedback. Uh, yeah. Tomorrow at um, for a COVID stop. Right. So the vaccine has not arrived in time, and we are asking if we can honor that appointment. Can you all hear that? Something about yeah, I do hear it now. <laughs> it's a different case. Let me go. I'll I just sent you the agenda. This, this meeting is called to order. I will correct this for yeah. a minute. Would all of us be so kind as to <clears throat> turn uh, turn off our sound for a moment? Okay. Okay, you can turn it back on. Let's see where we're at right now. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone uh, hear me? And if you would be so inclined, you can turn your your mics on as well. Thank you. Again, welcome. Our meeting was called to order at 5.33 p.m. And uh, we do have a quorum, so I would like to uh, take the roll for the group. And we'll begin here. Uh, Ms. Owen? Here. Ms. Pat? Here. Ms. Ferreira? Here. Mr. Vernon Jones? Here. Mr. Cage. Here. Ms. Walker. Ms. Walker. Here. Hi, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. And welcome, Ms. Moyston, um, Mr. Bachelman, to the meeting. Welcome also to any uh, community members who may be with us this evening. Um, and uh, we have a little bit different evening this evening, uh, but um, before we begin, uh, just want to check in on a few things and go over our agenda very briefly. Um, our agenda review tonight basically is the same as we've always had it. We um, are going to, I believe, look at minutes. We did, did everyone have a chance to read any of the minutes that came through? I know we got the, the packet kind of late as usual because of this over, it's an overload going on there. Ms. Moyson, you just send everything out, right? Okay, yes, but the minutes are the same ones. I sent them out in last week's packet. Yeah, okay. So we will go through the minutes and approve the minutes of those meetings. And um, beyond that, we will have public comment as we usually do, uh, welcoming comments and uh, thoughts from our community, which we will uh, listen to as we always do. And um, there are a couple of comments that need to be made by our, uh, our working, member, working members group, members of our working members group. And we are gonna entertain those at that particular time. And then we have um, our, our meeting agenda today is going to be, first, uh, we have a, a guest with us, uh, known to many of us in, in our community, uh, Dr. Barbara Love, one of um, a number of community members and agencies we will be talking to in the course of our work. And we're glad she's here tonight. Uh, we're going to be discussing the um, gift certificate proposal, which we've discussed in previous meetings. 
and we're going to take a look at and review the uh, the current bid phase one and phase two. And we'll get an update from the folks working on that and we'll have a discussion about that as well. And um, we'll review a list of BIPOC organizations, businesses and individuals uh, which uh, who we plan to uh, talk to, reach out to in the course of our work as a, as a working group. After that, as uh, we always do, we'll look at upcoming events and set our next meeting date and entertain any um, uh, comments on items that did not make the agenda within the 48 hour uh, prior advance notice time, and then we will adjourn. So uh, going forward, uh, I'd like to go through the approval of the minutes. And I can't remember, um, I think we did these one at a time, clearly, but uh, we'll go back right now and go to the, the approval of the uh, January 28th minutes. Yep, um, Mr. Wiley, so yeah. I was a little ambitious in thinking I was gonna get to the two, three and two ten. So it's really just the 128 minutes. That's, that's why I just, yeah, crossed those out myself on the thing. Okay. And, and uh, by the way, um, this is this is a monumental task that I think we all are aware of with uh, you know Ms. Moisson trying to put this together for her. We appreciate the work that goes into that. And as we go forward, you know, we'll all certainly try to um, get that information before before the group in a timely manner. But in the meantime, I want to appreciate the work going into it and uh, have us also exercise a little patience, especially around minutes, which are very extensive for this particular group in particular. So uh, uh, thanks again, Ms. Moyston, and we'll go forward with the um, review and approval of the January 28th minutes. Uh, does anyone have any, any corrections or comments they'd like to make on the January 28th minutes? Can you put it up? Comments, corrections, edits from the group. Can you scroll? There's a big chunk of information here that's uh, leaving a document here. So I may want to scroll down a little bit as we go. Mr. Vernon Jones. Oh, I can't be sure of this, but um, <laughs> in what's showing there, it says that I said that Ms. Pat and I realized there are two different sets of expertise needed. I think the two were outreach and then researching alternative service provision. Ms. Pat. 
my re my re recollection was when we're talking about um, phase phase one and two, phase two being um, legal focus as opposed to phase one. Okay, let's let's uh -huh. leave it the way it is then. Yeah, that's fine. Uh -huh. Other comments? I guess we can keep moving that down. Uh, Ms. Moyston, please. And we continue to scroll just a little bit, please. Thank you. Okay, moving along here. Thank you, Ms. Moyston. Move down maybe a half page. This was that long meeting, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I feel like I'm reliving it a little bit right now. <laughs> okay, let's move forward, please. Just so you know, I'm a unable to read this right now because I'm driving. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Glad you're, glad you're with us. Drive carefully. Will do, thanks. Okay, uh, please scroll. And that's the end. Okay. Um, I would... <clears throat> That, um, that question you had about the, the minutes, uh, Mr. Vernon Jones, was, was not a, a correction. We're just going to leave it the way it is. I, I withdraw my comment. Okay, thank you. So we, can we um, approve the minutes as a working group um, as they exist? Um, let's go by roll here. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones? Hi. Ms. Owen. Aye. Mr. Cage. Aye. Ms. Walker. Aye. And Ms. Pat. Aye. Okay, and myself is an aye. Thank you. You just need me. Yeah, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm just I'm rolling, <laughs> closing out the screen. When I read those notes, I have to pull up the entire screen because I'm I'm a little older than you, Ms. Ferrer. A lot older, actually, come to think of it. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, Ms. Ferrer. That was an eye. Younger than me, so stop it. <laughs> thank you all. Okay, the, the minutes have been, been of 128 have been approved. Thank you very much. And we'll we'll approve the 
um, next set of minutes, um, hopefully at our next meeting, um, as they should be able to appear in our packet then. Uh, we'd like to open it up to public comment now from uh, any of our- Area Love or Maryland Love. And from any of our um, visitors to the group, our community members who might be participating with us tonight, uh, you're welcome to make comment at this time. You'll be recognized by... Any, any uh, recognition? Any comments, Ms. Moyston? No, thank you. Okay, so uh, seeing that there are none, um, <clears throat> there, um, I'd like to go to our uh, committee uh, members at this point, our working group members for any uh, comments. The last meeting, we, we didn't uh, include this, um, this segment. Um, for particular reasons, we left it in this at this time because I know there's uh, at least one I, uh, and two public comments we'd like to make, um, and uh, to the to the public and to our group. And uh, let's start with Mr. Vernon Jones. So back in whatever November or whatever we, when we got appointed, I went through the conflict of interest training as you all did and realized that there was a situation I had to explore further. So I asked the town manager about it and he suggested I go right to the attorney at the State Ethics Commission. The situation is that I have sometimes in the past provided training and professional development uh, around race and racism and anti-racism and implicit bias. Um, and while it's never been a major source of income and it's not something uh, I plan on doing a lot more of. Um, there was at least one situation with the police department where um, a trainer who was a person of color asked me if I would be part of a team and wanted me as a white man to be uh, on the team. And we are gonna be talking about training or development uh, for police here. Um, and I was hoping that I might still be have the option to participate if I was asked in a training session for the police after our work is over. Uh, and what the attorney at the state told me is that it's up to the appointing officer, which in this case is um, <clears throat> the town manager, Paul Bachelman. Uh So I wrote to Mr. Bachelman explaining the situation and what the attorney said. Um, and he wrote back, uh, I'll read from his letter. I believe the spirit of the conflict of interest law is met with the letter you wrote to me in a public statement and a meeting of the community safety working group when this topic comes up. So there's transparency. I'm approving your continued service as a member of the community safety working group. So this is just a, a statement of disclosure. Uh, so there's no uh, sense of hidden agenda or, or conflict. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Vernon Jones. Let me just um, ask Mr. Bachman, do you think there's anything else yeah. that needs to be said at this point? No, and I think the I think it's it's good to disclose. Um, it's that's also the your statements um, is also on file with the, in the town clerk's office. Uh, so any anyone who seeks it can can read it. Um, I think you uh, members of the committee are not the contract awarding authority, and any kind of if there is if you are participating in any kind of contract do you of course would step away from any kind of consideration of that contract mm -hmm. thank you uh, mr bottom mr. mr vernon jones Ms. owen did you have your hand up okay I, i'd like to um uh make a comment as well uh similar to mr vernon jones and i uh took a similar action uh with mr mr Bachelman. um through the uh, company that my wife owns, Romney Associates, we have had the um, uh, occasion to do work this past fall with the police department. And 
while she was the principal in this particular case, I'm part of that. So similar to Mr. Vernon Jones's case, I wrote to Mr. Bachman as well. And uh, in similar fashion, you know, what, what I disclosed about the fact that we worked before and that, um, you know, my participation in terms of any training, you know, conversations, et cetera, would, you know, I would, you know, simply recuse myself from them if it came down to a point of uh, looking at potential contracts, et cetera. Uh, uh, the disclosure piece is important because, um, you know, you all need to know that we did that work in the past and um, don't intend to do it in, in the future. So uh, the same kind of thing, uh, same kind of letter, same kind of response from Mr. Bachelman, just so you know that we were in, uh, involved through uh, my, um, my wife's independent uh, consulting company. So very similar thing. So I thought it'd be a good time to say that as Mr. Jones, was, Mr. Vernon Jones was talking about his, uh, I would certainly disclose my previous work with the police department as well. So, so that's any other comments from um, others in the community working group? Ms. Pat. So um, I'm happy to hear that the town taps into our community resources to hear that both of you have done training with the police department is something I appreciate instead of getting people from outside our community. That's all I wanna say. Okay. Thank you. Other comments? Um, okay, I'm seeing people off screen. I know Ms. Bowman, you're, you're driving, but Mr. Cage, Ms. Walker, uh, you're not on screen now, so I'm, I am looking for that uh, hand raise, um, Ms. Moiston. So do I have, am I able to see that? Um, you should be able to see it. Once okay, it's, I'm just saying because I don't see raised, any, so I want to be sure that um, yeah. I'm not missing anything. Okay, thank There's you. There's no hands raised. Thank you very much. So um, given that I'd like, like to move forward, and, and again, thank the working group for the, all the hours they're, they're putting in to, to make this work happen. And uh, for those of you who are uh, in the community, listening to our, 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 our meeting tonight and participating in our meeting as, as um, a person, people who are absorbing information from this meeting. We have the privilege uh, this evening to invite uh, Dr. Barbara Love to our, to our panel. She um, is a member, longstanding member of our community and certainly a person who is well-versed in the areas of, of race, implicit bias, inclusion, and the, the list goes on. Uh, I do wanna say that she's known to many of us in this community, uh, respected by many of us in this community. And uh, we sought her out as we will other members of our community to discuss uh, issues around policing and, and safety in, uh, in, in the Amherst community. So, uh, this will not be the first time that this group will entertain the, the comments and certainly welcome the presence of community members who work on behalf of the BIPOC community uh, to this meeting. But she is uh, our first and gives our screen a little different look because she's new to it. Uh, she's not new to the work. Um, some of us have had a privilege to work with alongside Dr. Uh, Barbara Love. Some of us know her as a community member. Uh, some of us don't know her yet, so, you, but you will. So I do wanna uh, thank, uh, you know, Mr. Vernon Jones and maybe others who have participated in talking with uh, Dr. Love to, to get her to come here tonight. And Dr. Love, we wanna welcome you and thank you for your presence here tonight and your willingness to share some of your time and expertise with us. Um, 
So welcome. Welcome, Dr. Love. Happy to have you here. Muted. You're muted. Unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to come. And let me also begin with my thanks to you for your time and your energy and your commitment to doing this work. I know it's a lot of time. I know that it's a huge uh, bite uh, out of your life. And I'm grateful to you for your willingness to do it. I gave a speech once where I referred to the great Republic of Amherst. <laughs> and Amherst has that possibility of being the world that we want. And the work that you are doing is a step toward helping to make that happen. So I'm really, really glad that you're doing it. And please accept my thanks to you um, for your willingness to do it. Uh, I was given three questions, so I'll say something about those three questions, and then I'm, I'd love to, um, A, hear your thinking or any other questions that you'd like to uh, hear my thinking about. Yes, I've been, I, I have been in Amherst over half a century, and uh, even though I still call Arkansas home because that's where I was born, that's where I was raised, that's where my ancestors' bones are buried. But Amherst, in a very particular and special way, is, is my home. And um, getting to see us think about how we make it uh, a better place for everybody, a town that works well for everyone, is an extraordinary project to be a part of. Uh, the question that I was asked was, given the research that says implicit bias training doesn't reduce police violence, what do you believe can be done to change police behavior so that it is less racist and discriminatory? Second, what is your vision and what are your recommendations about how our working group can play a role in dismantling white supremacy in Amherst and any other hopes and recommendations and advice that I might offer to, to your group. So the first piece is about the research on implicit bias training. Let me say, don't believe the hype about the research. Um, the research does not say that implicit bias training doesn't have any effect. What they say is that they cannot prove that it reduces police violence. Reducing police violence is an important matrix, but it's not the only thing. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. The second is that uh, the research is widely removed from specifying how the goal they are seeking to measure is connected to the treatment or the training. In other words, L let me say it this way. How many of you ever took seventh grade algebra? Wave your hand. Come on, you all did. <laughs> now, um, research will not be able to prove that your seventh grade algebra reduced the number of mathematical mistakes that you have made in your work since then. Are you following me? The research similarly will not be able to prove that it didn't. In other words, the research on police bias doesn't, cannot, cannot prove that it didn't reduce and it cannot prove one way or the other. They simply aren't able to do it. But uh, aside from the difficulties with the framework of the research itself, which I think is a researcher's nightmare, here are these other issues. First of all, what training is the research measuring? There is no comprehensive curricula on um, implicit bias training. Second, who is delivering the, the training? And unfortunately, again, um, two members of your group have already talked tonight about delivering implicit bias training. And I have 100% confidence in the work that would be done, has been done, will be done by these two members of your group. I am also aware that a huge range of expertise and lack of expertise is involved in the delivery of implicit bias training. I happen to be aware of places where 
Somebody said we ought to have implicit bias training. The group or the company or the organization looked around to say, is, do, do we have any black people on our staff? Oh yeah, there is X. Well, let's ask S, X to deliver some implicit bias training. There is a huge range of things that goes in the name of implicit bias training. And there is no regulation, there's no organization, there's no certification. So what training is being measured by the research is beyond anyone's ability to name or to specify. So when you're looking at um, how the research measures the effectiveness of implicit bias training, they're measuring something. They have absolutely no idea what it is that they are measuring. And uh, second, the training, as far as I have been able to ascertain, has never been connected with the specific goal of reducing police violence. So the one training, I, I took a quick look after I got your question, and the New York City Police Department has done a huge thing on implicit bias training. They call it uh, fairness in policing. And here are the goals of their training. Let's see. Their, the goals of their training are to inform officers that bias influences everyone, to provide actionable instruction for minimizing its effect in the discharge of their duties, educating personnel about the science of implicit bias, outlining consequences that could possibly result from bias, uh, describing skills that personnel can employ to manage biases. Uh, trainers conceive that bias can happen and they explain that bias reduction in law enforcement is instrumental to increasing levels of procedural justice and police legitimacy. Now, here's, here's my question to you. Exactly which one of those objectives connected to reducing police violence? Go ahead, tell me. <laughs> In other words, you, you get my point. Uh, the efforts None. to measure. <laughs> I'll answer you. None. Yes, answer me. Yeah, I just didn't want to interrupt you. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the, the, the research doesn't give you uh, the picture that you assume that it is giving you. And the other thing about the, 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 the curricula for uh, implicit bias training, um, Apparently, the, the, the training ranges anywhere from a 30-minute lecture to 40 hours of training, with the most common uh, format being an eight-hour training. So again, I will ask you, if there is something that you have been immersed in all of your life, such as, for instance, structural racism, and you get an eight-hour training, how many of you are reasonably confident that it's going to change your behavior? Go ahead, wave your hand. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, question the research and do not accept that as a guideline for what your recommendations will be. Um, and I'll say a couple more things about uh, the notion of training. One is that people can't do what they don't know. And where in any of our, well, not you, because, because you're on this committee, I'm going to conclude that, well, in fact, I know most of you and I know those that I know, I know have uh, had the opportunity to spend some time thinking about this, learning about this, working on this, in fact, teaching about it. But most people have not had an opportunity to learn something about racial equity about implicit bias, about what it is, about how it gets manifested, about what, what to do about it. It wasn't in our elementary schools. It wasn't in our high schools. It wasn't in our college. Where did we get a chance to learn about it? Mm -hmm. And the average police person is just like the rest of us. They have not had that opportunity either. And I think my own attitude is that it's a little bit unfair to ask people to know about something, pay attention to something, and be able to do something that they have had no opportunity to learn something about. So hold that in your mind as you're thinking about what you will recommend or, 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 or what you will do or what, your, what attitude position you will take about training. One more thing about training. Most of the training focuses on sharing information. It's a cognitive approach. And keep in mind this uh, idea, information is not enough. So to illustrate my point, I will ask you to tell me 
How many of you know somebody who smokes cigarettes? Wave your hand. Nobody? Okay, everybody here knows somebody who smokes cigarettes. These people who smoke cigarettes, are they irrational, death-seeking people? No, these are your friends, your family, your relations, your friends, people who are near and dear to you. But yet, every time they light up a cigarette, they have to take it out of a package that has some information written on it that says, this will kill you. And they nevertheless pull out that cigarette and they light it up. I, I don't think I'm doing this quite right, but <laughs> you get my point. <laughs> my point is they have the information, but that did not change their behavior. So most training, which relies on sharing information, cognitive change, um, to change behavior simply is inadequate. The thing about racism is that it has hurt all of us, every single one of us. And in addition to information, which we need, like a lot of people need to hear, for instance, somebody say colorblindness is not necessarily a good thing and they need to hear the answer why. Because so many pe people assume, so many white people that I, I have met assume that colorblindness is good, that they're doing a good thing when they say, I don't know this color. And they need to get the information about why that might not necessarily be the most appropriate way to proceed if they want to reduce the effects of discrimination or, or, or racial bias in their work, say policing. So they, they, they need information, yes, but people also need a chance to heal. There is a certain kind of healing work that needs to occur when we talk about um, implicit bias or changing attitudes or changing behavior patterns related to racial equity work. The second thing that I would say is that training cannot be done in a vacuum. It must be done within an overall context of a vision of a liberatory vision for policing, a liberatory vision for a town. And it must be done within the context of some understandings about um, what is um, acceptable behavior some context about accountability, some context about where it is that we're going and what are the expectations that we have for individual members of our department in order to get us there. I had put together, uh, I, I collected, a bunch of things came to mind and I wanted to, to, to share a few of those examples, but I won't just because of time, about the context in which policing is occurring in the present time. Uh, but you do get to think about that and when, um, when you're thinking about training, remember that it's not happening in a vacuum. It's happening within a much larger context. And part of the recommendations that I hope that you will ultimately make will have something to do with that overall context. So let me say a couple of thoughts about what recommendations I would make for you. Um, the role that you can play in dismantling white supremacy in Amherst. First of all, that is an extraordinarily powerful vision in and of itself, that you can play a role in dismantling white supremacy in Amherst. So three things. One, I'd like to see you develop a procedure to engage the town in a visioning process about dismantling white supremacy. Get the whole town involved in visioning what that looks like. In order to vision what that looks like, they will necessarily have to spend some time learning about what that is and how it manifests itself in the town. What are the ways that it shows up? And to envision dismantling white supremacy in our town, they will have to spend some time figuring that out for themselves and then figuring it out for the larger community. That visioning process has to include everybody. It has to include business and higher education and the school system and philanthropy and social services, chamber of commerce, civic groups, community members, media, public health, faith communities, town governments, all aspects of the community need to be involved in this visioning process. And dialogue groups and listening sessions and information sessions and training programs, yes, and healing sessions, all sorts of ways of bringing people together to be involved in this visioning process for our town. And you've already learned that sending out notices <laughs> won't do it. You're going to need some community organizers, some people who, whose focus 
is on developing relationships with these broad segments of the community to get them involved, get their voices involved, engaging their interest and enlisting their support in this project. Because that uh, can be such an extraordinary project to have the whole town of Amherst involved in thinking together about what it means to have a town that is anti-racist, a town that is dismantling white supremacy, a town that is engaged in making itself a model community. And then finally, uh, oh, and let that process, that visioning process must conclude with some specific recommendations, action strategies, specific strategies for implementing the vision. Um, a liberatory vision guides the whole project and then specific strategies implements the project. And don't let your work in without giving the town manager some very specific next steps. What are the specific things that must be done in order to implement this vision? So what do I wanna to say to you? You are doing the work of the universe. You are figuring out how to create a better town, a better world. So let your love for this town show in all that you do. Uh, communicate your love for this town and your desire for it to be a better world in the way that you do what you do. Let, 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 let journey be the destination. Destination be a part of the journey. Let how you do what you do be a part of where you are trying to get to. And make your recommendation specific. Make sure you leave with an implement, implementation strategy and continue to expand your big thinking and make it bigger. No binary thinking here. You already, you've already cl uh, clarified that it's not uh, police or no police. It's not one thing or another. No binary thinking here. If it's not best to ask the police to do mental health work, then who should do it? If it's not best to ask the police to do social service work, then who should do it? If it's not best to ask the police to do child welfare work or family systems intervention or school truancy work, then who should do those things? And what are your, your proposed systems for having those needs met? So make sure your directions to the town manager are very specific about very specific parts of the community, needs of the community that must be addressed. Um, thank you. That's what I can say to you. Thank you for your willingness to serve. And as my mother used to say, <laughs> many thanks until you are better paid. <laughs> well, needless to say, uh, unless I'm speaking out of turn here, we, we've never met your mom. But if we do ever meet her in this life or another, we appreciate her <laughs> a whole lot for that comment. Let me let me just as 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 chair and certainly uh, in the midst of my my colleagues here, uh, who I have a tremendous respect for, uh, Dr. Love, I, I want to thank you for being here with us. I, I I and I would take responsibility for this. We we set aside an hour for you being here. You spoke for twenty minutes. I thought I spoke you're five. You're still, you're still on the hook for a few more minutes with us. So I, I'm hoping you have the time and the willingness to engage in some of a little bit of dialogue with our community service uh, safety working group. Mm -hmm. And um, I will, you know, if I if I may indulge in the group, we take a, a, a moment of just uh, muted reflection on what Dr. Love said right now. And then, you know, we can mute ourselves, reflect for literally a minute, like I'm gonna count that off, 60 seconds. Um, and we'll come back and see if there are any comments, questions, um, clarifications you need from Dr. Love. And Dr. Love, you would, if you sit with us for a little bit, we'd be blessed and happy to have you here. So does that work for everybody? Okay, so let's just mute ourselves for a minute. Uh, I'll come back to you in a minute and, uh, and we'll move forward from there.
Okay, I'd, I'd like to, to welcome you back. You can unmute yourself as you finish your, your own reflections on, on, on this moment. And uh, again, thank you, Dr. Love for being here and, and sharing your experience and expertise and wisdom with us. And I would like to open it up to the working group to see if you have any comments, questions, clarifications, thoughts you'd like to share with Dr. Love in, in the time she has here. And in the, we, we have about maybe 25, 30 minutes. Ms. Pat. Thank you, doc, uh, Dr. Love, um, for, coming, for coming to share your expertise with us. The question I have for you when you talk about engaging the whole town and visioning, what is the time frame would you recommend to us? Are we talking for 2021 or for a couple of years or? I would, um, this year for sure. And uh, given that for the foreseeable future, much of your work will continue to be done online, which unfortunately fools many of us, including myself, into thinking that we can do so much more than we actually can because it's being done online. But I would give it a quite uh, uh, finite time period of uh, six weeks or two months or three months. I'm not exactly sure uh, what the time would be. I'd, I'd, I'd I'd want you to sit down and kind of chart out who are all the people, who are all the groups we want to talk with, who are the various communities we want to be in touch with, what's the probable lead time we would need to have in order to uh, get their thinking into the process and from that project a time frame. So I don't have in my mind already a time frame for how long that would take, but I would uh, want you to kind of chart out what that would look like. And then let's set a, uh, not two years, no. Uh, not going into next year, no, this year. While, while, while you're, while you're the, the interest and energy of the committee is here and creating what I'm hoping is some uh, energy in the town around this topic. So I'd want you to do it I'd want it to be done, whomever is going to do it, within the next immediate period of time, this summer, this fall. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Pat. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Dr. Love. Uh, I, I, I've got to insert here, and, and, and you can be okay with this. You don't have to answer it, or you can answer it if you want to. How many of you didn't know Dr. Love before this meeting? I'm so glad to meet you. <laughs> See, the reason I asked that, Dr. Love, is because there are some young people here I want to acknowledge. I don't know if Darius Cage has his hand up, um, but he's our 14-year-old uh, community safety working group member. I want to recognize him for his efforts. You probably saw the article in the newspaper about him. He was on the cover of the Gazette with a bunch of other young people. So you, you, we, we have some people coming up. Uh, Ms. Owen is our vice chair. Ms. Walker has been very active and, and a major contributor to this work. And uh, so we, they're, they're, they're coming up. They, they, I'm, I'm really, really, really glad about that. And I hear you pushing yourself out the door, which is not going to work. <laughs> well, the, I'll tell you, the, the, these folks are chasing you, Dr. Love. You better don't look back. No, no, I got to reach for them. I got to get my hands on them. Yeah, you get your hands on them because yeah. they're, 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 they're contributors. And I just inserted that because I think you, just so the contextually, you know that this is, this is a group that's working very hard. And the town has worked very hard, by the way, to see that we get young people involved in this and our committee has been you know, working hard to get people involved. So thank you, Ms. Pat, for that question. Thank you, uh, 
uh, Dr. Love for the response. Other, other comments or questions for Dr. Love, Ms. Ferreira? Again, you know, I think everyone's going to keep on saying it, Dr. Love, that how happy we are that you're here with us and accepting our invitation and obviously for you to share your wealth of expertise and experience with us is just, you know, there's no words to describe it. So, um, you know, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the training aspect that you talked about in terms of implicit bias, which, of course, I'm on board with in terms of what you said. Um, and, uh, and I do understand that obviously, you know, quality and, and quantity is very important, right? Like who's presenting the information and how long the information is being presented, because you're right, you know, there's just myriads of trainers, myriads of information that's being shared. And then we call it implicit bias training, or we call it anti-racist training, or we call it whatever, just to kind of check off the box, right? Mm -hmm. Um but the other part though too that I see that's very imperative in this is uh, the aspect that I'm sure, you know, you know, a lot of us kind of grapple with this is the fact that even, you know, there is that whole checking the box, right? There is that whole kind of behind the, you know, who's making the decisions to bring these trainers in. And the fact that it's our, you know, black and brown bodies and people of color bodies that are at stake here, right? At the end of the day. Um, and the fact that, you know, year in and year out, I mean, and we're not talking about just, right, we're not talking about just the past 10 years or 20 years, we're talking about, you know, like 100 years, 200 years, that we're dealing with the same type of violence, you know, it, it, year in and year out, and then it's our bodies that are being, you know, you know, you know, just taken out, you know, as we saw, George Floyd was just, a, you know, the, the most recent, you know, and Breonna Taylor, and and the names and names and names and names and names, you know? Um, so, you know, so, so it's, it's imperative. It's, it's just critical, you know, that, that, that we get this right. You know, th th this can't continue. This cannot continue, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I understand that we're at this point, you know, in this, in this group to, to make some recommendations, um, but we, we really need to think about that, right? I mean, we don't have any more room for folks or for people who are in leadership to say, you know, well, I don't know what this means, or oh well, you know, I, I checked the box, oh well, they got this amount of information. No, if mm -hmm. if the if the result is that, you know, black and brown bodies are being violated, you know, in myriad of ways, right? Not just by taking away lives, but also by you know stops that are occurring, harassment, searches, arrests, right? That are just, you know, just doing away with people's families because not just the person being arrested or stopped. I mean, it, it has impact throughout a person's family, friends, town, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, th this has got to stop. So for me, I want to hear from you a little bit more, right? If you have any other, you know, nuggets to share with us, you know, in terms of how we can be effective as a group, right? To make really, you know, specific and detailed, as you said, recommendations to address that this is high state, you know what I'm saying? This, you know, this is you know, people dying, you know what I'm saying? And, and being violated and so on and so forth, not getting the services or the resources that they need. And at the end of the day, it being BIPOC, you know what I'm saying? That are most being impacted, you know, in terms of, and I understand that obviously this, is, you know, we, we understand that, you know, there's the numbers, there's this and that, but in terms of once we, we focus it on the data, we know we're the ones that are being most impacted. So, you know, obviously I could go on and on and on, but let me stop there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't, thank you for that question and the all of the um, heartfelt concern embodied in the question, uh, the, the recognition of the historical nature of the problem that we're facing, the fact that this isn't new, that it is ongoing, uh, that it is deeply entrenched within the society and, uh, and, and, and that now is the time. Uh, part of what I didn't talk about, uh, uh, Dr. Wiley, I just don't believe I talked 20 minutes. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> there's a few things I, I didn't say. <laughs> and one of which- Dr. Dr. Sister Love, let me tell you something. What? As soon as you came on, I started my stopwatch. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because I was looking how to stretch our agenda so we wouldn't have to do this other stuff so we could hear from you. 
Well, thank you. And I'm just going to make this short if I can. No, do what you need Uh, to do. uh, And that is to say that what you are trying to do, one, I said that police behavior has to be considered within the context of a department that has a liberatory vision, a liberatory framework, a set of understandings about uh, what, what is acceptable behavior and so on. But uh, a, a, a department, a police department exists within the context of a town. And this town, and I made the reference to the Republic of Amherst for a very specific reason, uh, this town exists within a national context. I wanted, for instance, to play for you the comments by Mitch McConnell about the culpability of the uh, 45th president and the events that happened on the Capitol on January 6 and match that up with his vote. Okay? That's the national context within which you are attempting to do your work. Mm. Uh, for Valentine's Day, the uh, officers in the LAPD sent around a, a, a Valentine that said, um, uh, you take my breath away with the picture of George Floyd. Oh, wow. That was, what, three days ago. That's the LAPD. Okay. That's the national context within which we are trying to do this work. And uh, you know, I had a few other examples uh, of what's the context within which you are working. I call it the Republic of Amherst because one of the things I remember being uh, so astonished by when I first came to Amherst many years ago was that the town of Amherst voted to withdraw from Vietnam. And the town of Amherst has voted, was one of the first uh, places in the country to vote that you should not smoke in public restaurants. The town of Amherst was one of the first places. In other words, I, I this go through this list of things that the town of Amherst was way out front in doing. So the town of Amherst is going to buck not only the national trend, but the trend right here in Western Massachusetts, you are sandwiched in between signs up and down the highway that say make America great again. And that is a stand in for a certain set of attitudes and beliefs and behavior patterns, which I have experienced. So you are trying to do something, your, 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 your task is to do something that makes Amherst different. So I no, I don't have uh, more very specific recommendations about what you should do. For instance, if you decide to do training, you can specify what are the things that you think the curricula should include. And you can specify what are the qualifications or the credentials of the people delivering the training uh, should have. And what's the experience you want them to have demonstrated if they're going to be the people delivering the training. So I mean, there there are all those kind of very specific things that you can do. um, That can provide some form and context to uh, the recommendations that you make. You can, for, for instance, I, I'm, I got excited about this visioning process. You can specify who are the people in the community who must have their voices at the table. Uh, because if this is going to work, all of these parts of the community would have to be involved. Where uh, the town of Amherst used to have on town um, uh, government staff somebody who was a liaison to the Cambodian community. As far as I know, that doesn't exist anymore. Somewhere along the way in the name of economics or in the name of budget saving or something like that, 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 as as far as I know, that staff person got cut. So how does the uh, Cambodian community connect with the town in general? I mean, there are just these very specific things which you can have on your plate to ensure that these things happen if you are going to create this better world, this better town, that you are uniquely positioned to lead the charge. Thank, thank you, uh, Ms. Ferreira, for, for that question. Thank you, doc, Dr. Love. As, as we transition to maybe the next comment or, or, or question, um, I, w- I was just, just thinking, I wrote a note down here, reminded me of, of uh, what, what James Baldwin said to us 
um, in his life. He said that, that we're, we're trapped in our history and our hip history is trapped in us. Mm -hmm. And I think if we remember that in that way, that us is not black people. Us is not BIPOC people. Us is everybody. Us is everybody. Is everybody. Absolutely. Their history is trapped in them and is trapped in us. And I think to unravel that, and I think that's the message. Be, I, if, I'm not speaking for you, Dr. Love, but yes, I think please. the message behind yeah. that is, is persistence and uh, commitment to sort of unraveling that history in a way that creates a conversation that, that, that en enlightens us to be able to do the next step work that we need to do. And I think that's, Ms. Ferreira, that's what you were saying, like, you know, what's, 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 what's the catalyst behind this charge that, that we have? And so, um, you know, thank you for the question, uh, Ms. Ferreira, and thank you, Dr. Love. Um, I want to just be sure, and because I, I don't see them on the, on the screen here, because I know, uh, Ms. Bowman, you are, um, you're driving and uh, you know, I want you to keep both hands on the wheel. Uh, and uh, Mr. Cage, uh, you, you're, you're not on the screen, I wanna make sure your hand is, but I wanna, I wanna take a minute if I may, before I go to anybody else in the community because Mr. Cage, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I wanna, I wanna make sure that you know you have an opportunity to be, uh, to commit to this. And as a, the youngest person, on, I think you're 14 years old, if I got that right. As a youngest person on our committee, I, I want you to have a voice in this conversation. And I just want to make sure that uh, that it's forward. So if you don't want to speak right now, you don't have to. But uh, it, if you do want to speak, I'm, I'm inviting you to do so right now. If you have any questions or comments for Dr. Love. Um, yeah, uh, so I don't have any like much to say, but I'm just I can say that I'm soaking all of this up and um, just taking this all down and like, um, I'm just gonna like use it in my work like I'm taking each piece that you say and I'm using I'm gonna use it well. So thank I thank you. Yep. Thank you. And Dr. Love just so you, so you know, Darius is, you know, he, he's here. He's also trying to be a student. He's also trying to be an athlete. So you know, his, this little brother's life is full. Okay, so yeah. I, I, that, I will, glad he's here. Uh, Ms. Bowman, I, I would just take Bowman, out I know you, you're on your car and I just want to reach out to you real quick. See if you have any comments before I move to the group that's on screen. No, I, I don't have any comments right now. Thank you, okay. Absorbing so, everything. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, so other, other folks' comments or, or, or questions for, uh, for Dr. Love, and, and uh, I think we've got about maybe, maybe 10 more minutes or so of her time, Ms. Pat. So Dr. Love, as um, when we had the uh, one minute break to reflect, for some of you who don't know, um, her daughter, Valerie, and my uh, first daughter, our best friend, Laura. And so I was reflecting on the healing sessions. How would that look like? Mm -hmm. Because the reason why I asked the question is, you know, for some of the uh, current residents and, you know, former residents of all races, People have had experiences that um, it would be nice to have the, you know, an opportunity for the town to engage in healing process. Are you thinking more of white people alone or everyone? Mm -hmm. Thank you um, for that question. And um, the healing sessions, I think, are important for everyone, for white people, BIPOC people, I, I use the term people of the global majority, it's just my personal preference, um, indigenous people for everyone, which is a little different from uh, the dialogue sessions that I'm also recommending, or speak and listen sessions, which are very useful 
for people to get a, to hear about the experiences of others without comment or judgment, et cetera. Um, uh, pa there are panels that we can have so that people can hear about and learn about the experiences of others. But the healing sessions um, take a very specific purpose and have a very specific form. And it's about individual people getting a chance to take a look at their own early experiences related to race and related to racism itself. Getting a chance to notice their earliest memories of knowing something about race, of recognizing themselves as raced beings, of having experiences of noticing that uh, people were treated differently because of their race, or getting a, ch a chance to recall their earliest experiences of of themselves being treated differently because of their race or noticing that life chances are sometimes governed by race. In other words, giving people a chance to go back and look at the ways in which the process under which the time in which they got racialized, they got learnings about race and getting a chance to talk about those experiences with the caring, aware attention of other human beings who are not trying to analyze them, not trying to fix them, not trying to uh, do anything except give them their aware attention so that they can do their own processing around how they came to know about race, how they got socialized around race, how they got the notions and the hurts of race that are inherent in this society installed on them. Uh, this would have to be a very carefully and thoughtfully organized and curated experience. Again, it's um, the way I most uh, recommend it be done is with groups of peer counselors who get trained to do that not just throw people together and ask them to do it, but train groups of peer counselors who can have those uh, kinds of sessions with each other. And most, uh, all of us can be trained to do it. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah. Thank you. Great question, Ms. Pat. I think that, that you know, builds a lot into you know, our thinking about our purpose as a group too. Um, I didn't do it at the beginning, uh, Dr. Love, but um, yeah, you probably uh, already picked it up, <laughs> certainly, about what our, our context is all about. So um, uh, if, you, if you need more information, any one of us would be happy to, to forward it to you if it, if it helps in any way. Yeah. Other, other comments? Um, and let me go to folks maybe who haven't had a chance to, to speak yet. Uh, no pressure, you don't have to speak. Just conscious of uh, Dr. Love's time and our time too. And we have maybe um, about 10 minutes, so. Um, Ms. Owen, could, could I hear from you? Yeah, um, I thought everything you said, everything you said, first of all, just really resonated with me. I really liked um, how you emphasized how we need to be very specific with our recommendations. Um, I think every person on this working group brings something different to the table. And I think that's what makes us so great. And I just want to thank you for your time and for all of your suggestions, because I do think this work has to continue and um, it, start, it starts here and we need to be specific and I don't know. I'm just really soaking it in. And I really do like the idea of um, healing sessions and learning how to be peer counselors. I really do think that there's a lot of utility in peer led resources. And I think it builds a lot of community. And I'm really excited to meet you. I'm glad to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. And could I hear from Ms. Walker? Um, hello, Dr. Love. Thank you for um, taking the time to speak with our group tonight. Um, it has been very informative for me. Um, and as a young mother growing up in Amherst, it, it just is really affirming for me to hear you speak about things very directly. And, and you're very knowledgeable because you've been here for such a long time. But I've also grown up here um, most of my life. But I'm just 
you know, just coming into these things. So it, I'm really appreciating hearing the knowledge right now. Thank you. So good to meet you. So good to meet you. Thank you all for having me once again. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, you know, I, I call it, <laughs> uh, th this is an Arkansas reference. So if it, if, if it doesn't, if you don't get it, it's okay to ask me what I mean. <laughs> but <laughs> you're giving what I call the pig's portion. You don't, okay, Paul is shaking his head. So imagine Hello. breakfast. My mother's from Alabama. Thank you. Okay, so imagine, go ahead. Imagine breakfast and there's eggs and bacon for breakfast. So a chicken gives a portion and a pig gives a portion. <laughs> You're giving the pig's portion. And I just want you to know, I, I acknowledge it on behalf of the town and my co-citizens. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, right. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Love, um, for your time and, and your presence here. Um, uh, just one last go around. Anyone else has anything else they want to say? You know, Mr. Bachelman. Ms. Mo Ms. Moyston, I know you're you're not on our our group, but you're here. You're right here. So I I I, I don't want to miss an opportunity, and I know Mr. Vernon Jones, and, and I know you, so we we're going to be a little sitting back here a little bit. But any other comments before I I let Dr. Love go? I defer to Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Dr. Love, thank you so much. You are just a wealth of inf information and inspiration at the same time. Um, so as I continue to kind of move in the, in the same direction of, I don't even know how to explain it, but um, do you have any suggestions as staff liaison? Because, you know, I'm kind of in the middle and I live, I'm a resident. So I always understand where our audience is coming from. I always understand where um, our our members are coming from, from the community safety working group, but I also understand the town side and like the best ways to get those points across to each other without being insulting, without like, you know, sometimes you just have to be blunt about stuff, but other times, you know, you can be a lot, you, you know, you can soften it up a little bit, but just mm -hmm. looking for some guidance in there and how best to steer this group and motivate a couple of other groups that don't have the same kind of energy that I'm really hoping to give to them. Mm -hmm. So exactly what you said, I'll take what you just said and give it back to you as advice. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> uh, you, you, you do have ideas, you do have a particular perspective uh, as a town employee, as a town resident, as a member of this committee. Uh, you have ideas to share with this committee, and I, I suggest that you, uh, I'm, I'm sure if you, uh, uh, what was I going to say, beg, the, beg the, the attention of the group, they will want to hear what you have to say. And then take these ideas to these other groups that you are thinking about and get them moving, put some fire under them, light them up. And, you know, um, a, a liberatory vision for our town is not too much to ask for anybody, for any group who is working in the town or on behalf of the town. And um, people uh, sometimes must be pushed, but they do move sometimes. Not always, but um, uh, sometimes it just takes one push to get them moving. And, and, and also remember, this is the wrong analogy, but I'll use it because it's what comes to my mind at the moment. It's always a straw that breaks a camel's back. It's, an, uh, you know, it, it, we, we, we wait for the big thing, we wait for the big moment, but it's a straw. Sometimes all that's needed is just that straw. So never, never underestimate the significance or the importance of what you bring. I value it. Um, remember that it's important. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bachelman. So I just, if, if people, I know some folks here were a part of the Black, uh, Black History Month event last night and Jen talked a lot personally about her growing up and uh, it was really powerful to me. And I think people is a, is a, a relatively small group, you know, decent sized group, you know, but her experiences and her, her history 
uh, was very compelling and it was a, a model for how to engage. It wasn't just a speech someone was giving, it, she was sharing her heart. And so that I found that really uh, powerful last night. Um, I think, um, Dr. Love, I find you to be very inspirational and I find honestly this group, this, this working group right now to be very inspirational to me too. Um, I love coming to the meetings and I find, I, uh, I just really appreciate the work that everybody's bringing and the passion and the, and the um, honesty and, um, uh, and, and anger and uh, things. I think that's all really important. I thought what you said to me, um, the big vision of saying dismantling structural racism in Amherst, that's a compelling vision. And then you sort of said we want to, but we have to be specific about how to get there. And I think that that's a very compelling vision. I think that we, if, if, we, if this group says this is the vision we want to achieve, I think the town will rally around it. And I think people will say, and now let's put the resources together to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And I thought the way you had contextualized it by being Amherst, our history is being ahead. We need to be stating that for town government, our individual departments, our individuals in the departments, and the town as a whole. So I really appreciate it. Um, I took a flurry of notes, so I appreciated that. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, Ms. Moyston, uh, Mr. Bachelman. Okay, Dr. Love, thank you. Thank so, you very so much, much for having me. For, for kicking off kind of our community engagement piece, if you will, I you know, for folks who are listening and certainly for, you know, this is recorded, we, we are on, on a mission to outreach to the community uh, in some ways that we even have yet to define, but we're, we're moving in that direction. So we hope, hopefully we'll, we'll have this kind of conversation uh, going forward. So thank you so much. We really, really appreciate you being here. You are so welcome. And thank you. Carry on. Thank you. So, um, I got to take a deep breath from that one for a minute, and <laughs> then go yeah. to the next, the next thing. Thank you all for your your input and, and thoughtfulness with with Dr. Love. I know she, you know, she is always very thoughtful and. Uh, uh, reflective on on her work and practice, and and it's nice to hear her say that she recognized that in us as well. So and so that we're we're good going forward in that way. I want to go right to um, the uh, the gift certificate proposal, and um, this is on our agenda. I'd like to just open it up to one uh, see what else we have to do with that. I know at the last the last meeting we talked about turning it over to the, the subcommittee was working on that to come up with uh, with a plan and design for this. And so I'd like to just turn it over to folks who are doing that to see uh, what the update is and where we need to go from here. Ms. Pat. I can go. Um, so we, um, Ms. Marston had, uh, contacted uh, Chamber of Commerce. Prior to that, maybe she will talk, talk about that. Um, for some reason, the town cannot directly handle the gift, gift certificate or cards. Um, if CSWG is going to do it, we have, you know, there has to be a separate account, bank account. And so the subgroup didn't think it's something we want to um, engage in. So. Ms. Marston contacted the Chamber of Commerce and spoke with the executive director and about um, them helping us out. Ms. Marston can, can speak more about that. But we did include um, BIPOC um, restaurant on, uh, restaurants, as was suggested the last time when we presented. So the, the, only, the only thing we added is just the restaurant and other businesses. So I'll let Ms. Marston speak about uh, going through uh, Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Yeah. Ms. Moyson, if you don't mind. 
sometimes the unmute at the bottom floats around and then I can't quite get to it to unmute myself. So mm -hmm. sorry about that. So I just want to say that I, we, I had a neighbor foods market and cousins to the list of businesses, you know, um, so that could be helpful to some individuals as well. So originally when I reached out to the chamber of commerce, it wasn't necessarily to link or to collaborate with them because I know that there's like this, you know, we, we had kind of talked about not collaborating with the chamber for multiple reasons. Um, but what I was looking for was the process that they used for their gift card program. So they have a gift card program where they have whatever businesses sign and you can bring that card to any of the businesses. So it's not just geared for one individual business. It can go to all of the businesses that are under the umbrella of that program. And so I was trying to have us monitor, you know, model that because we do have an issue of it's best practice for town municipal governments not to be giving um, individuals um, gift certificates. It's also would be helpful if we had a third party um, to help us, which part of that would have could have gone into the bid, but um, it's a little bit a, if, even if we put it into the second bid, we don't want to necessarily wait that long. So um, Claudia explained this very complicated process of what has to happen in the equipment that you have to purchase and the cards. And um, she offered, and I made it very clear that if we were to, and we would bring it back to the group. So first I brought it back to um, Pat and Miss Pat and Miss Owen, and um, that we would have to have a very distinguished line that this is, we are not to include the other businesses that aren't BIPOC in here. And like, there's no sale of these. This is us giving these cards to individuals. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, I know we weren't trying to collaborate with the chamber, but it seems like at the same time that it might do us some good. So it seems like it, it's kind of a win-win for everybody. So we don't have to deal with the whole process of, of the gift card, which I had never no idea that it was so complicated, right? And then um, we also, the chamber doesn't always have the best relationships with some of the BIPOC community members. So we are also connecting those BIPOC community members with the chamber to a certain amount of degree, right? So that they are able and to help them kind of build that bridge that they need to, to, to connect to each other. Um, and so you know, the only thing that I was very specific about was, you know, that this needs to stay as is. It doesn't fall underneath the bids. Um, just it's not a sponsored from the bid program so that we would have our own separate account from theirs where they um, sell their gift cards because we're not selling anything and we would purchase our own gift cards. And so it was a great conversation and Claudia is very interested. And so I just suggested that we bring it back to the group. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Pat and Ms. Moisten. Uh, comments from our, our working group. I actually think that's a really good idea, um, considering that how much we have on our plate and as long as they're able to follow through on their end with not including any of the non BIPOC community BIPOC businesses and they're able to keep our whole thing separate, like we don't run into issues with that. I, I don't, I think that that's a great idea. Okay. I will, I'm sorry, go ahead. I will say that it's so complicated that Claudia has actually had to hire somebody to take this piece over with their gift card program. So, uh, you know, none of us would have the capabilities of, of spearheading this. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'd like to, you know, given, given what we've just heard and given what, what, what I've read here and our, our past conversations around this, I'd like to, uh, move that we, you know, accept this proposal um, and we can, you know, if I could hear is a second from, from the group and then if we have any more conversation on that, then we can vote on it. So I'd like to put that as a motion as, as it exists on, on in print and certainly with the comments that were offered by Ms. Pat and um, Ms. Moisten. 
Ms. Pat, second. Uh, no, no. No, you don't? Okay. Okay. I'm looking for I a just, second to my motion. Huh? I'm looking for, I'm, I'm making a motion to accept this proposal. And then we discuss, right? And then we discuss, yeah. Okay, okay. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? Yes. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's actually not, I, I omitted one thing and I'm okay with it. And that is that Chamber of Commerce might charge us some fees as third party. And I'm okay with that. Oh, Ms. Moisson is saying no. What? Is that, is that no, Ms. Moisson? Is no. that a no? Before I say it's a flat no, a firm no, Claudia never mentioned a charge of okay. anything in our conversation. Okay. We were okay. speaking about collaborating. So okay. my guess is no, she's usually pretty okay. straightforward. Okay. And then I just didn't know, Miss Owen, do you have any comments about it too? Because you were in that group as well. That's right. No, I, I think it would be really beneficial for us to move forward with the chamber as long as everybody else is on board. Mr. Vernon Jones. I, I like the proposal and I'm in favor of our adopting it. Um, if there's an opportunity, I'd like to do it in a way that might create other opportunities for these gift cards in the future. Particularly if we get the whole town envisioning being anti-racist, um, there might be people who wanted to buy such a gift card just to the BIPOC businesses to give as a gift. Uh, it just, uh, you know, I think there are any number of possibilities about how this could, could grow or be used. And not that we need to adopt those or insist on them uh, at this point, but just to whatever we do, conduct it in a way that leaves open some possibilities for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, great suggestion. In fact, I, I heard on the news, I can't remember which town it was in or city, but there was a, a, a business owner in a town where everyone was struggling. And I, I think this particular business owner, I'm making an assumption here, may have been doing a little bit better than others in, in his area. And he actually bought gift certificates that he could give out to people in the town to purchase services and goods from other businesses in the town as a way of spreading the wealth, so to speak, knowing that some of these businesses, the small businesses in particular that were struggling. So in, in keeping Mr. Vernon Jones with what you're saying, uh, that there, there could be some traction here, you know, in the future to engage the community in such a way. Ms. Pat. So I'm sorry, I've been talking too much tonight, but, um, Thank you, Mr. Um, Ross, for suggesting that. I just wanted to comment that, you know, this particular pr uh, project was very personal for me because this has been one of my dreams in Ames to really be able to amplify uh, BIPOC businesses that has never happened. So I'm hoping, I'm hopeful <clears throat> that this is a step of doing that. You, you know, when we're putting the list together, it was very, very emotional and personal for me. Mm -hmm. as a former and current business owner in Amherst. So, because I, I run a, a residential program for people with special need. So I just want to say, I got a lot out of doing this in a, in a positive way. I'm, I'm very excited for, for showcasing uh, BIPOC businesses. That's good. And it, it seems like we're, we're going to get a lot out of it as well as a result of your work and Ms. Owen and others, thank you for doing all this as well. Um, we, we have a, a, a motion that's been seconded. We have some discussion. I, uh, unless there's any other discussion, I'd like to bring this to a vote. Um, those, in, those in favor of going forward with this proposal uh, as it stands, you can raise your hand. Okay, so. I don't have a camera right now, but I agree yeah. with you. See, Darius, this is the thing about older people and younger people. <laughs> we, we can see you, but we got, not, we got our eye on you, man. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, Ms. Bowman, I didn't see a hand. Um, Ms., Mr. Vernon Jones. Oh, I was just 
hoping we could ask for Ms. Bowman's vote. It'd be nice to say this was unanimous thing. if possible. Yeah, it'd be great. My hand's up. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Gotcha. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thanks all of you who put so much time and effort into this. It's a very worthwhile cause and moving us in the direction we're trying to go in the spirit of this work we're doing. So this, this is great. Um, we're gonna, um, uh, let's see, move my, uh, my agenda around here a little bit. Uh, the bid process, phase one and phase two. Um, I'd like to turn that over it, it, immediately. We did receive a document uh, re regarding uh, this, this work and I'd like to turn it over to the folks who are currently involved in the follow-up and hopefully engage our, our committee in, in the discussion of, of our next steps. So uh, Mr. Vernon Jones and um, Well, all right. Let me let me try to report on our subcommittee meeting and ask Ms. Walker, Walker <laughs> Ms. <yeah. Pat> to <laughs> interrupt me, correct me as I go. Um, so let's see. Let's start with phase one. Uh, phase one, the invitation for bid is out now. Uh, it's out as a single IFB that people, uh, people can bid on any or all of uh, the three sections. Uh, and it calls for a complete report finished by April 2nd on the alternative community safety services and for a completed report on outreach and community input by April 30th. Uh, and the contracts, if granted, would end no later than May 1st. Mm -hmm. Um, and it might be all one firm or it might be separate firms for the different pieces. Um, Mr. Delaney did receive a comment from a national firm, a potential biz bidder, that they believe based on their experience working with other communities that the work we've described uh, in the phase one IFB would normally be done over six months to a year. Um, so our subcommittee thinks it's possible that we will not receive any bids or that the bids we receive will be high. And we realize we never had a conversation about uh, how much we are able or willing to spend uh, on the uh, phase, phase one. Uh, and when we get a bid, when we get, if we get bids, uh, we will need to be uh, deciding pretty quickly about that. Um, the general feeling on our subcommittee was that the community outreach is a bigger and longer process even than we've put in or allowed time for uh, in this bid. Um, and we think maybe more time and more money are needed for that. But at the same time, we don't wanna miss the opportunity to create a pilot project for alternative safety services uh, and to get in funding requests for uh, next year's budget. So we see those as, as high priorities regardless of what we do or don't get for bids and whether we need, even though we think we need more money and time to do it, a good job of it. Um, then we drafted, and I think it's it gets sent to everybody, uh, the scope of work for uh, a phase two IFB. Uh, and again, we put this together and then we looked at it uh, and it seemed like a huge amount of work. Uh, again, that would take more time and perhaps more money than we have. Um, so we, I think we, we like our description of what needs to be done. Uh, and we don't really know what to recommend about timelines. Uh, we had some question about um, whether funds beyond the uh, 80,000 might be available from the held police positions or whether there was a way to carry some of this over into the next budget year so that uh, money from the next budget year could 
uh, could be accessed. Um, let's see, there's, there's a lot more I could say, but let's, let me leave it there and ask Alicia and Ms. Pat to add or comment or, or differ. <laughs> Let me I'll, I'll let Alicia go first. Okay, sorry. I, I was trying to think of what else I could add. I think Mr. Vernon Jones touched all of the main points of our conversation from last week. Um, and I think those were the things that we wanted to bring back to the whole group for discussion. So I don't know, unless there's something else Ms. Pat thought of that we missed, I think I actually wanted to hear what the rest of the group thought about that because I think like we did we had a lot of discussion as to how the subcommittee felt about those things. Um, so I just want to hear as to the rest of the group where everybody sits with those things. So I'll, so I'll go. Um, I think Mr. Ross, you captured what we discussed. I think um, I'm not sure if it, it was a consensus, but we were also thinking about deferring phase two for now like we were looking into fall was that correct does that resonate with both of you no i shouldn't say fall but then let's see what the phase one goes we also talked about if we didn't get any response or we didn't like the the phase one i ifp is that a a, a plan b a plan yeah, backup plan. And then Mr. Delaney has suggested re request for quote. Do two of you remember the conversation? Um, yeah, um, one possibility if the bids are high or if we don't get any, that we could pick some pieces of work, uh, maybe a more limited pilot outreach project for now, and maybe a, a piece of research about alternative community services and simply request quotes uh, from three uh, suppliers. Uh, and then you have to take the, the low quote. Let me just mention two other things that we did talk about. One was, well, we see a need for more funds. Uh, we did not feel that the additional funds should come from monies that might otherwise fund social services, education, climate action, or other town needs uh, that if, well, we think we need more money. We think it should come from the police budget because it really is about policing or what has been policing in the past. And the other is that we have a feeling that the term of either the term of our group should be extended to fulfill the work beyond uh, June or our work should immediately be picked up by a new citizen review commission fully empowered and funded to continue our work for racial justice and community safety on an ongoing basis. Thank you, I remember all that, yep. Well. <laughs> so one, one more thing. Um, didn't Mr. Delaney uh, talk about getting another written question beside one? There was two questions that he received, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yes, what was the other one? Uh, <laughs> can, I, can, have I, it, Alicia? can I can I interrupt while you're thinking of that I, I was on mute and I, I was oh. trying to recognize Ms. Bowman and I, I apologize, Ms. Bowman, I was on mute so you didn't hear me, but she had her hand up after Ms. Mr. Vernon Jones's comment. So uh, go ahead, Ms. Bowman. Yeah. Sorry about that. So what I'm wondering is this. Um, Have we, have any, has anybody looked into what, I believe I brought it up last week or something. Um, what, did I sh shut my video off too? Jeez. All right, sorry. There you um, are. <laughs> so we were talking, last week I mentioned um, what Denver police were doing. Um, I think it was Denver. And I haven't been keeping up with it more this week but last week they had only been it had only been implemented like a week earlier so it was like really 
new. And it kind of seems to me like we need to look at stuff that can be implemented immediately without having to, to um, without having to worry about the bids. Like we need to filter out things that we can, like we can, suggestions that we can make now that doesn't, that doesn't require a lot of research and a lot of work. I mean, there's certain things that it seems like it's pretty straightforward and pretty obvious to me that police should not be attending somebody who's having a mental health crisis. That's across the board. That should not be the first person they see. They're having a mental health crisis. They, the police are not somebody they want to see. They need somebody who's going to help them, who is going to actually assist them in whatever they're going through. So I just, I just, I don't know. I'm just feeling like there's, yeah, there's things that we have to do that are going to take a lot longer, but there's, I feel like we're not looking at the things that we have, that we can do that can be implemented immediately without, without research that, it, that doesn't require the research and the, you know, and the talking to the, necessarily talking to the communities or whatever, like, yeah, we need to have an interpreter, you know, come in with, you know, whatever group, you know, if we, um, you know, if we do a specific company, you know, we need to have maybe, you know, you have to be aware that, oh, that my person speaks, you know, this language or that person speaks that language. So when you go, you need to have somebody who's speaking that language with you, whatever. Like, and that's, those are things that are like a lot, I feel like are a lot more minor than having police callers show up. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. So I, yeah. I, that's, I think we really need to do that mm -hmm. um, as soon as possible um, as we try to refigure, refigure these bids and how, like, like recognizing that, yeah, we might not get these bids, we might not be able to, like, they might be asking for way more money, so on and so forth. Okay, but we have to be doing something now. And I think that's where... Um, I think your I think your comments, Ms. Bowen, are exactly where we're at at, at this point. I mean, I, I if the the subcommittee working on this is saying that we we might be hitting a, a, a bit of a stall or a roadblock in certain ways. So what what can we do on an interim basis to keep momentum going and keep things right. moving? So I I don't want to speak any more to that because Ms. Ferrer, you had your hand up and uh, I, and I want to let you know I'm listening. I just yeah okay. Ms. Ferrer and then Ms. Moyston. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with um, uh, Ms. Sashina too uh, in terms of what she was saying. I mean, I think, you know, and I and I and I get it that obviously, you know, with the subcommittee, and thank you all for putting, you know, all the work that you're doing into the phase one, phase two, um, and you know, and I think obviously you all met beforehand. There's more information, and now you're sharing more information with us. But I think I think we need to go stage by stage, right? We haven't, we don't have the bids back. So we don't know what we're going to get, you know what I'm saying? So I, 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 you know, so for my thing is like, I think we need to kind of, okay, let's, let's see what we get. Right. Cause I've gotten some, some, some folks because I've been putting it out there and I've gotten some folks that are interested and they're planning to, to, to do stuff with it, you know, cause I sent them to Anthony. I was like, go ask them and stuff like that, you know, but I know there's interest there. So my thing is let's just wait and see, you know, what happens with phase one. Right. Um, and then phase two, the same thing. I think we need to put it out there. That's one. Right. Two is in terms of what Ms. Bow Ms. Bowman said, which is, you know, even if we don't get anyone, we need to get this work done. This is the opportunity that we have. We, we, we got a charge, especially around, you know, the, the first one, because Ms. Bachman already told us, budget is gonna be going out for fiscal year, you know? So we need to make some recommendations, you know, regardless of a consultant or not. You know, that's, that, that's my feeling. And I, obviously we need to talk more about it, but, that's that part that we need to discuss. And then, you know, the other part that I think about is, is you know, and obviously that's more for Mr. Barkerman, you know, how much money do we have? You know, is it 40,000? Because you had said 80,000. Is it 40,000 for uh, phase one? Is it 40,000 for phase two? But also I know we're giving these $25, you know, gift cards. I don't know if that's coming out of a different pot. And so then, you know, so I guess we need to have a conversation around that budget and stuff like that. But I think we can't put the, the, the cart before the horse type of thing. I, I just say, let's keep going, you know, and if, and if um, you know, we don't have, if we don't get the consultants, we still need to make some recommendations. Um, and then let's see about, 
but we need to extend it. I, I don't know if we're there yet. I, I'm not ready to say that I need to extend work to fall and so on and so forth. Mm. I still need a lot more information to kind of figure that out. Thank you, uh, Ms. Freer. And then Ms. Moyston, I think you had your hand up then, Ms. Ms. Owen. Yeah, so just quickly, there's a lot of things. So we have a budget in our in our account that's $80,000. So out of $80,000, your stipends all come out of that. The gift card program will come out of that as well. And if the ambassador program, I, well, I don't think that the ambassador program will move forward um, as of yet, but if that was to come out of it, you have to keep in mind, even if we do have a consultant, that, that the ambassador program has to be funded through the, those funds as well. So that's one piece of it. Two, um, as of yet, Anthony hasn't received any more inquiries and he hasn't received any um, bids submitted. But he says often that bids are submitted, you know, up until the last day. It's very common. So there's that possibility there. Um, also, the third thing was that there was a group who wanted to know if they could work I don't know, was that the same group that wanted to work outside of the scope of the police department? Meaning they pretty much wanted to come in and work on all aspects of systemic racism and anti-racist work, just not limited to the community safety working groups charge of the police department. So, and then they asked a budget question, um, which Anthony was like, I suggest that we not respond to that because right. of the, the nature that it was. Um, so, you know, I agree with Ms. Fiera and Ms. Bowman that you guys do need to, to keep moving, right? Because one of the things that gets really frustrating about town boards and committees is you hit roadblocks like everywhere and then the momentum kind of stops. And so you have to keep the momentum going. And I, I don't think that it's out of our reach or out of our touch bid or no bid completed or, or not that we start thinking about the different things and the different ways that we can make recommendations, right? Because we still have to bring those to the consultant, like the things that we want to see happen, we still have to bring to the consultant. So either way, we have to think about those. And again, I, I'm, I'm still very, very firm in believing that you have to put stuff in place, this group needs to put stuff in place so that if this group was not to be there, that the work would still be getting done, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the ways of that happening is definitely going to be like community safety doesn't just end, right? Like it just doesn't end because somebody wrote us a charge that says we're going to go to this date. And now whether it's you guys or, or another group of people, the community safety working group, I would suggest, you know, and you guys can think about this, that the work continues on. Um, I also think that the, the police oversight committee that needs to happen because there are two different aspects of dealing with the, the, the work. One is dealing directly with the police department and one is dealing with the community safety aspect, which is a little bit broader than um, that group. So then it comes into budget. We have to have recommendations with somebody who submitted with a consultant or without a consultant. We have to have recommendations in for a budget. I don't really know that piece. I was a little bit astonished when I, they started throwing out numbers of what the consultant may charge or might not charge to do this type of work. So I was like, wow. Um, so we definitely need a, a larger budget. Um, and it's, we're, we're in a hard time because we are, everybody's being affected right now by COVID. So um, I just really would suggest that you guys start thinking about having the community safety working group at minimum work longer so that whether it's you guys or, or a new board comes about with the same um, guidelines that it has to be so three quarters BIPOC or I'm not quite sure what the actual status of this group is, but I think it's like eight out of 11 members have to be BIPOC community members. Um, but that way that the the bids, if they're not met by budget time, can be deferred to the FY22 budget. And perhaps that that FY22 budget will give us, we'll have more because we'll have what we had left over plus more funds, hopefully, that have been recommended from the recommended to the council. Thank you. Ms. Owen. Uh, Ms. Moisten answered my question. Okay, I, I did want to comment on on this too, and I'm sorry, Mr. Vernon Jones, you want to go ahead, and I I will comment after you. No, so, why don't you go first? I'll go next. 
I just wanted to say that I think, you know, some of the things I heard from you, Mr. Vernon Jones, and from uh, Ms. Walker uh, is, is that, um, you know, we're aware, uh, and certainly Ms. Moister too, you know, that we're aware that things don't necessarily run, you know, in lockstep towards some logical end here for what needs to happen. And that we'd be remiss, I think, if we didn't sort of, you know, put some benchmarks out there to when we're going to, you know, put in place some contingency plans in case this happens or that happens or the next happens. I'm, I'm kind of in line with what Ms. Ferreira is saying is that uh, we, we do have a bid process that's um, ending on the 22nd. And uh, so maybe that's a benchmark, but in advance of the benchmark, you know, what kind of contingencies are we thinking about going forward? Is it a, a longer commitment from the community service safety working group? Is it, a, is it um, you know, maybe engaging the, the um, um, ambassadors in a different way, uh, pre-consultant, for example, is it going into you know you know some preliminary recommendations about uh, dealing with mental health uh, interventions and things of that nature that Ms. Bowman is talking about? So I think along the way, I think we're seeing that there, there's a running parallel to getting uh, a person on board to help us from a uh, consultative in a consultative role running parallel to that is a timeline to get some things done in an efficient and effective manner. So how we do that, you know, has to be part of a discussion we're having. And I'm just labeling it contingency planning because we have to be ready in case A doesn't happen, what's B gonna look like? And, you know, you know, go on from there. So not to belabor that, but Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm kind of where Ms. Bowman is about looking at this Denver program. Uh, they've actually, they've, they started last June. So they've just, they finished six months. Um, and, you know, we have a link to an article. Um, I would love it if our next meeting was partly dealing with whatever, whatever we did or didn't get in the bid and that the rest of it, we, if we could come to the meeting, having already read the little article about Denver, it's not, long or complicated and really actually brainstorm what are our recommendations even if we don't agree about everything get down a list of what is it we think alternative you know are we ready to decide is it part of the police department is it contracted out is it a separate town department we might be ready to make that decision about a recommendation some other things you know does it include dealing with the schools or not Maybe we're ready, maybe we're not, but we could begin to actually write down what in our current understanding, what is it we would like to create? Um, because I, you know, I think we wanna create it sooner rather than later. Uh, and I wanna do all the kind of visioning Dr. Love talked about. Um, but meanwhile, we need a parallel track. I think really putting together the beginnings of a recommendation. Some preliminary recommendations, you know, may certainly be in order, and I think we're we're easy edging up on that because we 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 know a lot already, and uh, I think just and then I'll go to you, Mr. Bachman. I'm sorry, but I I I, I think we're you know, we have to keep in mind that there's also um, there's there's a parallel uh, function going on in the town, you know, with the budget and how it's planned and how this is going to be impacted. So you know, keeping, keeping that sort of background music, if you will, in, in our, in our, per, in our view that, uh, you know, some of the decisions we, we make even in a preliminary way may be impacting budget, uh, next budget, future budget, uh, we don't know. So I, I'm, a, I guess that's a roundabout way of agreeing with what I'm hearing from the, from the group as, as well. Mr. Bachman. Thank you. So I think it's important to look at the charge of the committee, why, why the working group was established. And the working group was established with sort of a short, short, short term, medium term. And I think Dr. Love brought up sort of a longer term goal. And I think um, this longer term goal isn't articulated in the charge, but you might want to say we should put that into the charge. I have to make re renovations. I have to make revisions to the charge anyway, because some of the dates are changed. 
so in the charge, it talks about investigating alternative models such as the Eugene Cahoots program, the Albuquerque Community Safety Alternative Program, and the Denver Star Program. Looking at three things, those were the three things that we knew about back in you know September when we wrote the charge. Like that's those things are out there; they're being used in actual communities. It's interesting to see that the Denver Star Program is actually up and running, so they have some evidence that we we can draw on. So the the short term thing is to uh, the working group has to deliver a report on the alternative options to public safety services currently provided by the Amherst Police Department, and that's the short term goal. And that's something we'd like to be able to implement this fiscal year. And that's why, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't touch the $80,000. It would come from different source of funds for that. And that's why we've held those two positions, the plant, police department vacant. If there were something that we wanted to fund out of this, it would come from those funds. Mm -hmm. The second, the sort of medium range goal is the recommendations for resident oversight and policy reforms for the Amherst Police Department. That's the oversight commission or whatever that's there's no requirement to get that finished until June 30th so that's sort of a medium range goal and that's that's the bigger conversation you've sort of established and then the bigger goal is the whole uh, dismantling structural racism um, that's that Dr. Love talked about which you might say you know what and we want to put we think this should be on the uh, part of our budget for next year as well and whether it's this group and you say we want to extend our charge or if you said we want to create a different group to to lead that, that's it's. I, I think the the bad thing about a different group leading is that it takes time for the group to get organized and set up. If you are all willing to continue, that would be a powerful thing. The police oversight commission would be a different group. That'd be a if you're looking at something like that, that'd be a permanent committee that would have to be established with a charge. But I think you know, I think it's important to wait for the the bids to come in because that's a path we walk down. Uh, but then soon after that, I think it's worth it to start looking at these alternative models that are out there and in the next month, you know, the next three or four meetings, do the research, come back, discuss them, line them up and see what, what are the elements we like of each one and what can we start to offer here as a town um, so that we can implement it before uh, June 30th even. So those are my thoughts is, I, I, think, I think you're in a really good spot. I think we've gone through a ton of information gathering and processing and now you're ready to start to act and I think you're really poised to, to do the, the work for a, a real work product to come out. But I would just encourage you to look back at the charge about why we why you were created um, and um, and what, what how do we get to the end zone. Thank you very much. Um, so um, this is this is it's clearly a, a very focused discussion we're going to have to have, and I think um, maybe Mr. Vernon Jones, you suggested an agenda item, which included a discussion like this, in addition to the reading of the uh, the the uh, article about the, the Denver um, intervent uh, initiative that they're taking. We could include that on an on an, uh, on our next agenda, and could should. Uh, in this case, and then that would incorporate all of these ideas that are coming in with the goal of uh, setting forward some next steps as uh, referred to, you know, uh, by Mr. Bachelman in terms of helping us, you know, get this organized and, and looking back, you know, certainly at our, um, uh, you know, our, our purpose and our, and our charge. I think those are important, important things to do. Um, if, if that's agreeable to everyone, I, I would like to support that going on the agenda uh, for for next time. And uh, what what I'd like to do to, to to stimulate that and inform that discussion is maybe put out a brief a brief um, uh, blurb to the the group based on this conversation about what are some of the considerations we want we want to undertake during this um, this conversation at our next meeting. And you know, of course, you have input into that as well. But I would initiate something as a, as a catalyst of the discussion to see uh, how, how it how it fits with what people are thinking right now, and then we can engage in that process at our next meeting. I think it's an important piece, and then it also follows the the uh, the twenty second deadline of our the bid process. So 
we will have other information at that time. Uh, any comments, yay or nay on that? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up. Okay, I'd be happy to do that. I'm also conscious of the time right now. It, it's uh, a little after 7.30 and uh, we are trying to aim it at 7.30. Uh, if, there, no, if there are any other comments about this, I'll take maybe, maybe one or two other comments and then we'll, we'll move forward so we can uh, continue with our meeting. Ms. Ms. Moyston. Yep, so I just, Anthony wanted to, this is an email that he sent for you guys um, to be seen by you. So who will be helping him when it comes to the evaluations of the bids on Monday? Um, he would like to know who that is. The opening is at 2 p.m. on Monday, and then you, there's the Zoom link, but I can re-forward that out. I'm supposed to be helping him, I believe, for the, because um, this is to um, start assessing the bids, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, I, I was supposed to help, and I think Ms. Pat and, um, volunteered as well. Okay. That's, that's what I have in mind notes that it was Ms. Bowman and, and, and Ms. Pat were to do that. What's, what, what do they have to do, the, um, Ms. Ms. Moyston? What do they need to know? What do they need to do in preparation for that? They hear from Ms. Mr. Uh, Delaney or? No, I don't know that they need to necessarily do anything. I, they're, you're gonna, apparently it's going live on, the, on Zoom. So you'll be attending that meeting and I will forward your contact information to Anthony okay. so he can include you guys. Mr. Vernon Jones, I just want, we do have an understanding that at this point that we're not going to accept a bid until our whole committee sees it. Uh, or is there some amount of money or division I think of work I that think should happen a sooner? I think that there's a, there's a parameter that what we're doing is assessing and fi figuring out whether the bids fit in with the, the parameter of what we're looking at, what we're looking for. And then from what I understand, then we would present it to the group and figure out which bid we're taking. If I'm, I don't know, Mr. Bachelman, you could- Bachelman, you had your hand up. Yeah, so I think, so what will happen on Monday is um, the group will gather and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a, you're literally opening envelopes and he'll, he'll do that in public so everybody can see it and anybody can watch them do that and then you read what the price is and you read and then the content is shared out um, so people can review it um, you probably won't do your assessment right then and there um, I, I, I'm not sure how Anthony will if, it depends how complex the, the documents are he probably will create a, a file that everybody will take home and start to review it ultimately it'll be it'll come I think it's it's really looking for the, the town manager is the is the awarding authority, but it's going to be the work the work the full working group that's going to say here's what we want to do with this. We we want to accept a bid. We don't want to accept a bid. This process is for the low bid to be accepted if it meets all the criteria, like uh, Ms. Bowman said. If it if it hits all the criteria, then you need to award the low bid or or, or reject them all if you want. So Ms. So Mr. Bachelman, so the, 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 the two members of our, our working group who are in this process on, on, on the group's behalf will be at the opening of these things. They mm -hmm. will see these, uh, these bids. And at that point, you said a file is, is, is opened up. Who reviews that file beyond the, the uh, you know, Ms. Pat and Ms. Bowman? I think Ms. Pat and Ms. Bowman will talk with Anthony about what the, um about the proposals as well as, as much as they can digest at that time. I don't know if it's gonna be like a 60 page proposal or a right. two page proposal, sort of hard to judge. Um, but, go ahead. but ultimately it, it'll go back to the full committee. That, that's what I wanted to do. Would it be available to the, the full committee um, okay. by Wednesday? Oh, sure, the next day. And that's also any discussion around that would be public. Mm -hmm. Okay. So given that, we should probably get that on our agenda too as well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Vernon Jones and then Ms. Ms. Pat. Well, only that if, if we're going to talk about it on Wednesday, it would help some of us to be able to be reading it Tuesday night. Exactly. Uh, so <laughs> the sooner we could all get yeah. copies of things, the better we'll, we'll oh. do in our meeting, I think. 
Yeah, I think you'll be able to get it before the end of close of business on Monday. Great. Bid openings at 2 o'clock. Yeah. Ms. Pereira? Yeah, I mean, I guess, so what we're going to be getting, though, are only the ones that Ms. Pat and, and Mr. Sheena have, have kind of, and, and Anthony have looked at, though, right, to see that they meet, meet and they're like the lowest or whatever. I thought that they would have to meet the reference. I don't think we need to all look at everything, though, because what's the point of having them then? I thought they were going to kind of sift through and just bring us the ones that meet the, what we asked them for. Yeah, so from what I what I was understanding is that we're opening them, you know, they're getting open so that we can look at what the lowest bid is. And then when we look at the lowest like bid, whatever the lowest bid is, we have to verify their yeah. references. That's what it is. You know, so there's a verification process, but like once they're all open, they're still there for people to view. It's just that we're at that point, we're saying, okay, whose references check? And then if anything, from what I'm, what I gather is that we would be presenting the lowest bid whose references all check out to the group. So the rest of them technically, not that they don't matter, but they don't matter because we're taking the lowest, that's what we, the lowest bid whose references check out, that's who we're taking. Yeah, yeah, that's what was my understanding. That's right. Yeah, right. Ms. Pat, Ms. Pat and then Mr. Byrne Jones. So uh, Ms. Bowen just said exactly what I was about, about to say. In addition to the lowest bid, bidder, we also need to check out the references. And then we present um, according to the IFB uh, requirements. You know, we pick um, the most eligible one to the larger group on Wednesday. Meanwhile, like on Tuesday, you guys might will be able to get a document to review so that it will be easier to discuss on Wednesday. Like Ms. Ferreira stated, I don't see the point of everybody saying, say we, we got like 10 bidders. No. It will not be time e uh, efficient at all if uh, the whole group have to review 10 bidders, for example. So that's the whole point of having subcommittee review the lowest. It's very straightforward. Lowest bidder and checking out the references and then you know presenting it to the general uh, committee on Wednesday. Mr. Warren Jones. Well I I agree. Uh, we don't need to second guess you on checking out the references. That's mm -hmm. that's your department. However, because we will have invited bidders to bid for each of the three pieces separately. We really need to, it may all be the same, but we need to know the lowest bid for each of the three pieces, mm -hmm. as well as the lowest bid for the total. Yes. And if that's four different groups, we need to know whether all of them meet the, the reference requirements or not. Yep. Yes. And I, I guess I'm getting back to the, the point of, is the, the, the timing of this, going to work for us by Wednesday. Ms. Walker. Um, so I'm just wondering what exactly the verification of references entails. Are they going to be just reading? Because we asked for written recommendations. So are they just going to be reading them over? Are they also going to contact the employers? Or do we have like certain questions we would ask? Or are we just simply reading the letters of recommendation. Ms. Pat. My understanding is that in addition to the written uh, references that we're, we need to, to call folks, and I'm hoping, you know, we'll be, we'll be able to get hold of them by Tuesday, you know, before our big meeting on Wednesday. Like uh, Mr. Wiley has stated, do we have enough time by Wednesday? Do we want to move our meeting on Thursday? Is that more reasonable? So that we make sure that we get reference, uh, we actually speak to people. What do people think about moving our well, meeting on Thursday? Before, you, before we entertain that question more broadly, I think Ms. Walker, you had your hand up again. Sorry. Uh, no, it's okay, thank you. I was just wondering though, when you call the people for the references, are you just saying just to confirm that you guys sent a positive reference to us or are we asking them specific questions or we're just confirming that they are the ones who sent us the letter?
I, so, I, yeah, so usually, I mean, with reference checks, even though they sent the letter, what you want to do is you want to review the letter, and then mm -hmm. usually through the letter, you have certain things that, are, that you want more clearance on, or you have more questions on, and those are the things, and, and what you want to do is obviously kind of like have a set of questions, you know, make sure mm -hmm. that, you know, pretty much the questions are, are pretty similar, you know, throughout for the candidate so that it's not unfair, you're posing more difficult uh, questions for one over the other, even though this is all like, it's gonna be only one bid, right? The lowest bid. So I don't think you have that issue, but if they have two references, you just have to make sure that the, those two references, you know, you're asking pretty similar questions to the two references and then kind of going beyond that, right? To clarify, to dig in. And if that's the reason for those phone calls, because like I said, I mean, I've, I've, I've not hired people based on those phone calls because what they send in a lot of times is just kind of like embellishment a lot of times, you know? Mm -hmm. So you might want to have to, to deep, dig a little bit deeper. Ms. Pat. So for fair, I mean, I, I, I do hiring all the time and I check for references. And I, you know, I, I haven't spoken to uh, Mr. Delaney. I am assuming that when we pick the lowest bidders, that three of us will come up with specific uh, questions that we will ask so that it, it will be fair to, to our potential um, choice. So it will be the same question, but we haven't created any questions yet. So I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to do that at some point on Monday after the opening of the envelopes. It's my thinking. It will not just be to answer um, Alicia's question. It won't be random question just like that. It has to be written down and we have to be fair in case we have three different bids or even four with lowest bids. So we have to be consistent with our questions. Ms. Walker. <clears throat> okay, thank you for the clarification. And then I would just also be wondering, is that something that Mrs. Pat and Ms. Bowman would be able to collaborate and come up with themselves before the opening of the bids on Monday? Or is that something we would have oh. to build more time into our plan four and then also just a reminder that if we are thinking about pushing back our meeting next week that our proposed kickoff meeting in the bid invitation is next Thursday. So I think that we should see what what the references are and what the information they give us in the references before we come up with a set of questions because then we have an idea of like what this person is saying, okay, but they said A, B, and C. So we need to understand where they're coming from, from A, B, and C, or what specifically they're talking about with A, B, and C. So I think that, I, I don't think it makes sense to be making questions before we even see presented in front of us, if that makes any sense. Ms. Walker, I mean, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms., Ms. Pat. Um, um, Ms. Bowen, that's a good suggestion. I am wondering, if it's okay with the group, if the um, the subcommittee can come up with some of the questions, because I remember when we we're working on phase one, we were very particular about making sure that um, bidders will have uh, experience on anti-racism work and things like that. I'm wondering if it's okay for the three of us again to come up with some few questions that um, Ms. Bowen, myself, and Anthony could use before Monday. I just have a question about that though. Okay. Um, you guys outlined in the bid what you were looking for, right? Yes. So yes. if you outlined it in the bid, they should all, all the reference, the references they receive should already be answering those basic questions. Not necessarily, sometimes they don't. <laughs> right, but that's where we come up with other questions to go into it and to get to dig deeper. And like, so, so when, they're, when they're presenting their bid, they're trying to answer the question, the, they're trying to answer the qualifications that we already laid out for them. If it's unclear, then we would preserve further if they're the lowest bid. So this is all based upon if they're the lowest bid. If they're not the lowest bid, like I said, they don't. Need, it doesn't even matter. But if they're the lowest bid, then we, 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 you and me, produce 
questions that fit that bid that that person's done to see if that bid is actually the references for that bid actually matter. So I really think the, the questions need to be specific to the bid. We have to be, because sometimes um, people who uh, put on bid, if they don't get it, they have the right to find out why, you know, other person got it. So we have to be consistent with our process. If we're going to ask people a question, it has to be the same for we're know, not the asking, US bidders. We're not asking different questions. We're looking at the lowest bid. The first, the first answer to why you didn't get the bid is because you weren't the lowest. The next question is because your references didn't pan out. It's, it's there, it's, it's, you know, it's very, I feel like it's very specific to each person, each person is bidding, like nothing matters. In first place, nothing matters except the sex, the, the lowest bid. That's the first thing that matters. Yes. If I want to, if, if I may, if, if I may interject here, you know, uh, Mr. Bachelman, that is the case. Is that true? If it's a low bid, then you're looking at that one, and this is, I think, echoing, I think what Ms. Bowman is saying too. If that's a low bid, then you're looking through that lens at that low bid. If that low bid uh, doesn't sufficiently answer the questions, or maybe there are some marginal things or clarifications, at that point, the, you know, uh, Ms. Ms. Pat and, and Ms. Bowman create the kind of inquiry that would shed some light on, on, this, on this bid as to whether or not we would want to pursue it or not. Is that accurate? That's, that's accurate. If, you, if it meets the criteria, the low bid wins, it, there's no discretion involved. So uh, then in, in that, okay, Mr. Vernon Jones? Yeah. Well, again, just to remember, there's discretion about whether we take both the community outreach and right. the alternative services or whether we just take one. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. And, and also, uh, Mr. Anthony also um, advised us that if we're not even satisfied with any of the bidders, we can just close it. We don't have to do anything. And then our backup uh, plan would be to actually solicit consultants in the right. community, like three, and actually um, reach out to them and say, send us quote what you think this, this project will cost will be our, our backup plan. If we're not happy with any of the bids on Monday, we were told we have that option. Am I making sense to people? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So, I know it's a lot to digest, but. It's a lot to digest, and, and yeah. but also it's it's also it's it's pretty concrete. You know, we're looking yes. at an event that's happening on Monday, and you know we have to, we have to deal with that. And I, I I think that the thing for me is I'm saying you know once that event happens and those bids are opened, and they're looked at, we we have to somehow take that information and and funnel it through our process. You know, um, as a group to see if this is the direction we want to go. And I, I think I'm just a little concerned about the, the time frame. Uh, I have no, no problem with saying, you know, to uh, Ms. Ms. Bowman and, and, and Ms. Pat to look at that and create some uh, further questions for inquiry. I don't, I don't have any issue with that, uh, none at all. Uh, I started wondering, you think about contingencies, uh, one, what if we, we come up with all that information on Monday night and the calls are made, you know, from Monday afternoon and Monday night, those calls are made and we can't reach the, the references. And we, we can't reach the references on Tuesday. And then we've, and we've scheduled some time on Wednesday to talk about this, we're gonna be up against the wall. So I'm, I, I guess I'm, I'm worried a little bit about the time frame on how to, to process this, because we don't want to rush into this as a, as a decision. Ms. Pat. Let me ask people this. Are people okay for, do we want to even meet next week? Say it again, if people want. Do, do we want to meet next week? If, you know, we don't know if we're going to actually, you know, talk to the references. 
before Thursday or Wednesday? Do we want to meet next week? It doesn't matter to me. So. You mean as a community safety working group? Yes. Yeah, Mr. Vernon Jones, we have some. Uh, Ms. Ms. Walker's ideas. hand was up before mine. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Walker. Um, no, it's okay. I just wanted to um, just loop back and reiterate the fact that in the bid proposal, our kickoff meeting with the consultant group is next Thursday. So I'm not sure how we would address that or if I, I just don't know what we would do about that because we already have that as a meeting. Mr. Vernon Jones? Well, I absolutely think we need to meet next week, okay. uh, if only to get started on the alternative services discussion. Um, and I think it's unlikely that we're going to be able to meet with the bidder uh, on Thursday, despite what it says in the bid, because we haven't decided whether we're taking any bid or, or whether we're doing all of it or pieces of it or and I don't, I don't see how we make that this, I mean, I guess if we met Wednesday and then met again Thursday with the bidder. Um, yeah, I don't, I miss, Ms. Ferreira, I'm sorry, you had your hand up and then Ms. Ms. Yeah. Moore. I mean, I think that that's the thing. I think that, you know, one, I agree with Mr. Vernon Jones, we need to meet next week, you know, on mm -hmm. whatever Wednesday or what have you to talk about the other issues that we need to talk about with the recommendations and so on and so forth, I charge. Uh, but I think we need to have some flexibility. Obviously, I think we put that in the bid saying we'd meet on Thursday, but if, if we haven't finished vetting the candidates by then, we can't meet with them on Thursday, you know? So I think we just need to talk to, to, to Mr. Delaney off, I don't know if it's with you, Mr. Bachman, just to kind of see how we would tweak that and, and send that message out because we're, we can't be rushed into anything. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we could discuss on Wednesday if we do have well, uh, how do we do it? Because again, I'm not very familiar with the bid. So, because I was going to say on Wednesday, could we discuss some, you know, what we have or no, then we would just table it till the next week or maybe do a special meeting at the end of the week or something like that, because we'd want to keep the things moving, you know, uh, but, but we can't just rush into making a decision. Ms. Walker and then Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, I agree with Mrs. Ferreira, and I think so. What I what I would propose or think would be helpful is we should definitely meet next week. Maybe if we can bump it to Thursday in hopes that we may have information. Because I mean, best case scenario, we reach out to the references and we we get them on the first try, and then on Thursday we're we're ready to talk about it. Um, and that would be great. And if not on Thursday, we'll talk about the recommendations for alternative safety surface surfaces services, which I think we should do either way. Um, but I think we should have both of those things on the agenda for next week and maybe just push out the meeting a day in anticipation that we may have answers or we may come to find that we don't have any bids and we can discuss that then also thereafter, just so that we give that time to work out if it is going to work out. And then my other question would be, I'm not sure how important dates are in the bidding process. So if that would be something we would have to submit another addendum for, or if we can just, once we find a consultant, even if it's after the kickoff date, discuss it with them at that point, mm -hmm. or if we would have to submit something on the bidding website saying, this is actually not our kickoff date. I think we should. I concur with that, that, that thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones, and then uh, Ms. Pat. Well, I'm inclined to have us meet Wednesday. Maybe we'll have everything. We'll certainly have everything except the confirmation of the references. Mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe also post a meeting for Thursday when we would just come back and say, yeah, we got the references, the decision we made Wednesday, we can go ahead with, or no, the references didn't check out. So now we got to do something different. Um, but have our main meeting on Wednesday and just uh, if we don't have references, then we come back Thursday and uh, make that decision. Uh, and if we don't need that meeting, we don't, we don't keep it, but we got them both posted. Mm -hmm. Ms. Bowman. Oh, wait a minute. Did I skip somebody there? It was, no, it's Pat, okay. I think. No, no, it's okay. Bowen can go. Ms. Bowman. Go ahead. So I agree with Mr. Vernon Jones. I really think that we should proceed as like as planned and really 
you know, but between me and Miss Pat and I forgot the other guy's name. I'm sorry. Um, but we we do what we need to do on Monday and try to, you know, Monday and Tuesday and try to get what we need to get done. And then, oh, I saw him. Oh. And then um, proceed. Um, and then if we need to push it up, then we need to push it. But I think, I, I don't, I think one of the thought processes that we're gonna be, I think we're, we're putting, we're making it harder than it, it needs to be the, the the most difficult part of re accepting this bid is when not their references check out and and we're ex like we've said before we're accepting the lowest we're not accepting but we're the only bid we're we're really looking into and reviewing is the lowest bid then we go on to the next bid uh, in hopefully the next if we ha if we have to move to the next bid, bid then that's then we will do that but i think that for the time being, I, I'm not sure that it's necessary to push the meeting right now. I don't know. That's just my opinion. Well, let me take let me take one the last two comments and let's move this forward because I think we're kind of circling around the the the, the fire here and we, we're we're going to have our next meeting anyway on Wednesday. So let's let's make sure we do that. Uh, I don't know who was first, Ms. Pat or Mr. Vernon. Oh, I was just going to say that I don't want anybody to think that. I'm suggesting that we don't meet next week. Any day is actually, you know, fine with me. I'm very flexible with my schedule. So, yeah. you know, Wednesday is fine. I just wanted to- Brennan Jones? I just want to say in my experience, if you can't get a hold of somebody's references on Tuesday, you contact the bidder and say, you're at risk of losing the bid because we can't get <clears> your <throat> references. Most bidders will get their references available on Wednesday morning. I would suggest that we, you know, go ahead with our regular scheduled meeting on Wednesday. I'd also suggest that, you know, going back, that you know, we, we do double posting. I, I don't want to leave leave ourselves at at risk of not being able to discuss this during the week. But if we had a posted meeting on Wednesday, uh, on Tuesday we post a meeting for Thursday, um, and then you know that could be that Thursday meeting could be a very straightforward, simple task. Um, but we'll have a chance to, to thoroughly go through that on, on Wednesday uh, in, a, in a more thorough discussion. And we'll know a lot more on Wednesday than we certainly know right now. So that, that's what I'd like to propose. Thumbs up. Okay. So let's, let's do that. And um, I'm, I, while we're on that, um, I'm, I'm skipping over a little bit because we're way over time and, and I, I apologize, but it seemed like this was a necessary conversation to have. Um, the, um, hmm, where'd I go here? Um, I'd, I'd like to postpone that discussion about the, the BIPOC, um, I'm sorry, the um, list of, of BIPOC organizations to our, our Wednesday meeting. So we can devote some uh, concentrated time on that. And that'll be on our agenda next Wednesday. Um, in addition to the, um, the response to the, uh, the bid on Wednesday and those two things. And then the discussion about the uh, alternative, uh, I forgot the wording that I heard um, Potential alternative services is that it? That uh, yeah, something like that. I'll I'll be more coherent after I get some sleep tonight. But you know, anyway. But those hey. those these those, <laughs> those these three things would be on our agenda for next Wednesday, and remind people to um, uh, get agenda items if there are any others to Miss Moiston by uh, Monday at one o'clock for the Wednesday meeting. Uh, I just, I only have two of the things. I have add the BIPOC list to the agenda and the potential alternative services conversation. Was there a third thing? Cause you'd mentioned three. Just, I guess it, just an update of where we are with the, the, the process that's going on on Monday for our, uh, okay. with uh, Ms. Ms. Pat and Ms. Ms. Bowman. Mm -hmm. So 
So that said, um, thank you. Are there any other, um, any, any upcoming events? Ms. Owen. I wanted to remind you guys all about the um, domestic violence workshop with Safe Passages tomorrow. I did get a chance to talk with the facilitators of that conversation and workshop a little bit before this meeting. She is on board with recording the meeting um, if the other volunteers or people attending are comfortable with it, just because they're doing a breakout room as part of the workshop. And she wants to make sure that it's a safe space and that um, people are comfortable with being recorded. I'll bring it up next week when we talk about alternative safety services, because I do think that we need to consider mm -hmm. um, looking into the support that's available in the community for victims of domestic violence. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, it's important work. Um, next meeting dates, we've already stated that we're gonna go uh, next Wednesday and next Thursday with postings, uh, agenda, recommendations on Monday and Tuesday of next week. Um, that all clear? Okay, we're good there. Um, any other topics? I think we've discussed about everything tonight, but Ms. Pat. It's not a, yeah. So I just want to really thank uh, Ms. Moistin and the Town of Amherst and Human Rights Commission for putting together uh, an event last night. And if you, you know, guys have a chance, I will really encourage you to, to watch it. Is that on YouTube or on the website um, about um, Black families? And I really, uh, it was really um, interesting to listen to Ms. Moistin. Um, growing up in Amherst. So I'll encourage people to watch it. And I think I read somewhere that um, she was also recognized for rising municipal employee or something like that, somewhere. So yes. can we get that, can we get this? <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Good job. I also read that she'll be speaking <laughs> at Chamber of Commerce, is it next week? Yes. Right? And when, I was on the Mill District live this she's afternoon, everywhere. so I'm just so, letting you guys, it's you know. like everywhere, so I just want to, you know, I appreciate her. She's everywhere. Um, thank you they, for the work they, you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you yeah. And thank you to agent. the town manager for, you know, <laughs> encouraging that too. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. Is she paying you a fee? Everywhere. She's everywhere. Agent? Huh? I said she's everywhere. Yeah, and I asked you, I said, are you paying her a fee to be her agent? Anyway, so it's funny. Listen, You're funny. It's late. It's late. It's late. It's late. It's mm -hmm. very, very late. Thank you. I we, have a recommendation for her. One more thing. Uh, can I can I suggest that we yes. our suggestion for alternative um, uh, public uh, safety? Can we submit it before the meeting next week instead of you, you can submit things to Miss Moiston that go into the packet for next week to be sure. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm suggesting that perhaps we should all submit to Ms. Marston before the meeting our recommendation for oh. services, you know, to save time. Oh. Instead of us just, you know. I got you. I'm we sorry. Have been at the meeting. I don't know. Is that, does that work protocol wise, Ms. Marston? Sure. Okay. It, uh, yeah. It, yeah. I mean, if you send the recommendations, I can consolidate them and then send them out to you guys as a group. And then it's got to be in a little cleaner, enough, certainly to get get out to everybody so we can read them. Yeah, read the recommendations. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all. Um, I'd. Um, so wait. So by when do you want those in? Then I guess we need to know that when you say early enough. By when? Well, talking about. Uh, anything that they want to be reading before our Wednesday meeting. Is that where we're going, Ms. Pat? I mean, I just want to make sure we get them early enough so that they get for, through Ms. Moisten to be distributed to the, the group so we can read yeah. them before the meeting. And I, and I typically send you guys exactly what's in the packet as it comes in versus waiting for the complete packet minus the agenda, right? So if- Thank you. If, if um, Mr. Vernon Jones sends me something that I know is gonna go into the packet, I send it to you guys when I get it, if that makes sense, right? So 
I guess I'm going to say Friday. How about that? Does that or Monday? Friday is always early. works for me. Is that enough time? Uh, Monday for me. Monday? Monday for me. Yeah. Okay. Monday. Right. Can we do Monday before two? Like by <clears throat> 12 noon? That way we, you know, the subcommittee for, yeah, so we have time to focus on the other one. Monday by noon time. That's fine. Are you asking the group? Yes. Yep. yep. That works for me. That's fine. Thumbs up, everybody. Let's give her an answer. So, okay. Thank you all. I welcome a, a, a motion then to, to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Thank you. Second. Second it. Ms. Ferreira. Thank you all. Uh, Meeting is adjourned, it's um, 8.09 p.m. Thank you all for your hard work, all your questions and thoughtfulness, and uh, we'll get busy again next week. Thank you, have a great night. Good night, everyone. Bye.